Good morning. Thank you for joining us. We give you a very warm welcome and if it's your first time with us, we give you a special welcome and we hope you enjoy your time with us. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful God, we are so glad to be in your presence today and we thank you that you always have something new to share with us. Give us receptive hearts to receive from you today and thank you that you are our place of refuge and strength and you're always there to help us in our troubles. Thank you because you are, because you are with us that we don't need to be afraid and we always have the assurance of your presence with us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. you might be a bit surprised that I'm talking to you from my car this morning but for me this is a very special place and I just wanted to share it with you this morning. Now for some years I used to travel quite a bit and regularly spent two or three hours at a time in my car and me and my car felt very much like a team. I often travelled very early in the morning when there was very little traffic on the roads 
and in all kinds of weather. Sometimes it was very scary on the exposed motorway I travelled along and I can remember days when the wind would blow my car around or the rain would come down so hard, even with my wipers on full, um, I couldn't see a thing and I'd often get to my destination and I'd have a big sigh of relief and say, thank you Lord, thank goodness I'm here. And then there were days, I can remember once, when there was snow and we were all stuck in this snow and there was a lorry sliding towards me and I was in my mind planning how I, where I was going to spend the night. But much as I had many scary days, I also had some of the most beautiful days and I can remember one morning, um, be about quarter to five, and there was, it was a really, really wintry day and there was hardly anybody on the road and I put my full beam on and it just reminded me a little bit of the snowman when the snowman was on the motorbike and he had his headlight on full and I felt a bit like that and it was just like a winter wonderland it was just so beautiful and then there was days when I set off in the dark and I watched the dawn come and in the summer the fields and the trees and it was just stunning. But I think one of the nicest experiences was um, um, coming out and hearing the dawn chorus, just me, ready to get into my car, and this deafening sound of the most beautiful uh, birds in the morning. Absolutely great. And I do look back on those days with great fondness for me and my car, and although I look around at my car now and it's getting old, there's some rust on it, a few bumps and knocks where things have happened and many, many miles on the clock. And soon, I know I, the, the, the car's come to the end of its life and I'll have to trade it in perhaps for something else. And I know that when that day comes that I'm going to be very, very sad. But there's an even more important reason why my memories of being in this car are so precious. This was a time in my life when I experienced such closeness with God. And I often thought of my car as my little tabernacle. I always thought of the children of Israel going around with the tabernacle and it always went with them. God's presence always went with them on their travels. And this was my little tabernacle where God was always with me. And whenever... I, w I was there, you know, I just felt that great closeness of God and I felt that he was always keeping me safe and speaking into my life. And I think to have a, a precious place where that always connects you with God is very special indeed. And for me, this was a place where I could pour out my heart to God, but better still, it was a place where I could just sit and meditate on God and I could listen for his voice and he never ever failed to speak to me. Sometimes he might talk to me about some attitudes that I had that needed to be changed. Other times it might be revealing something precious about what he wanted me to do. And other times as I just sat and meditated he'd give me the answers to questions that I'd tried my best to answer and I couldn't find the answers. It was just incredible. Right, I'm just going to read um, a few verses now from, uh, from Hebrews, and it's Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 22. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. It's all because of Jesus that we can move into that intimate place with God. Right, we're now going to have a time when we can sing our praises to our God from our homes. And I pray that God will lead you to your special place. And together we will all hear his voice and receive the encouragement and the guidance he so wants to give us. God bless you. And after that, Jan is going to lead us in communion today.
Good morning everyone. It's so nice to be with you all this morning and to be able to share communion with you. This morning I'd like to start with the words our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. And now we'll break bread together. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, take and eat this in remembrance of him. And the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, drink in remembrance of him and be thankful. Lord, each day when we are awake, may we enjoy sweet communion with you and be satisfied with seeing your likeness. Amen. Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning service. I do pray that the Lord's already speaking to us and through us and that we are enjoying fellowship, uh, albeit virtual, over the internet with one another. I want to look at a, a few scriptures this morning briefly, Luke chapter 24, we'll start out, then we'll go to Revelation and then to the two books that Paul wrote to Timothy. In Luke 24, it's just a, a three verses taken out of the story of the two on the road to Emmaus. And uh, it's the point where Jesus has been uh, convinced to go into their home with them and just to spend the night there for his own safety. Uh, uh, so they sat around the table and he's there with them. There's the two of them and Jesus. And it says that Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. So the picture is, is simply that he's just sharing the meal out um, as the honoured guest, I, I suppose. And at that moment, their eyes were opened, it says. And they recognised Jesus. He spent a long time, possibly hours, talking with them about scripture. But when they sat down to eat together, and their eyes were open, they recognised him, and he disappeared from their sight. It says, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while, we, while he talked with us along the road and opened the scriptures to us? When I read that, uh, recently it just really challenged me that how often do we have Jesus by our side as we're speaking with people perhaps trying to encourage them trying to uh, help them in a situation how often is that person the Lord Jesus remember the story when he the parable when he he, he said uh, you didn't look after me when I was naked when I was hungry they said well why didn't we we never saw you naked and hungry Lord he says, when you didn't see it in other people, you didn't see it in me. And, uh, and I think we just need a, a, a stronger awareness of the presence of Jesus with us, recognising that he is there 
all the time. When Jesus is central to our conversation, our fellowship, our lives, then we are released. Then we are healed. Then we are strengthened and invigorated. Above the, the, the scripture again that we read, it says, their eyes were opened and they recognised him. Oh Lord, I pray that our eyes will be opened this morning to recognise you in new and living ways. In, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. He knows who he is and we need to recognise who he is. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning of everything and the end of everything. He is eternal. He is our Lord. He is the Creator. And we just need to have that awareness of his presence with us. But that wasn't a one-off statement there in Revelation 1. Because it's repeated right at the end in, in, Re in Revelation 21 and verse 6. And it says, he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. When it says there, it is done, that reminds me so much of, of when Christ was on the cross. And he says, it is finished. The job is complete. I am Alpha, I created, I am Omega, I have generated and given uh, forgiveness to each and every one. And, and he's saying that he will give water to us. He will refresh us. He will nourish us. He will care for us because he is who he is. But it wasn't just in chapter 1 and chapter 21, but also in Revelation 22. Again, he repeats that phrase. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. This shows our deep need of Christ Jesus to be Lord of our life. So often we talk, we, we pray to Jesus, we talk to Christ Jesus, but he must be the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the boss. He is the man. He is God Almighty, he is our brother, he is our saviour, he is everything that we need. But it only comes when he is Lord, when he's in our lives in such a way that it impacts our daily walk with him. We, the more faith we put in him, the better our life will become. He's eternal. He's a human being. He also has our best interests at heart. And he has planned our path. Who better to take us through life? Whether we are seven or seventy, whether we're at the beginning or towards the end, we still need daily to make Jesus Lord. Give him more than we gave him yesterday. And be searching so we can give him even more tomorrow. That every day, he is the centre of all that we are and all that we do. Do you remember that advert on the telly? I, I, I thought it was great and I can remember how it evolved and it became, uh, it, it, it became a saying in its own right. The, the, the guy would hold up a tin and the statement would be, it does exactly what it says on the tin. And if you were telling somebody how to do a job and helping them, and they're saying, well, what about this, what about that? You see, it's, it's just do what it says on the tin. It's straightforward, do it, get on with it. And I wonder, what does it say on our tin? What does it say that we are like? When people see us, what label do they, they, they give us? What, what pigeonhole will they try and squeeze us into? How would they recognise us? But the question is, does it, do we do what it says on the tin? I read a book uh, last week, it's, uh, it's just more of a pamphlet than a book, and if you look at the bottom you just see there, it was uh, produced 
for Holocaust Mem Memorial Day, which was on the 27th um, of January. And, um, and I thought that looked really, really good. So I read, I read through it. It was titled, Why Me? And uh, all the different groups that were, went through the gas chambers and through the, through, through, through the Holocaust, uh, there's a, it was very, very varied. So I ran, read through and I was interested to find out just who um, had been in the camps because I'd never really seen a definitive list before. And as I read down, I read about Jehovah's Witnesses. I read about Roma and Sinti people, they, that's uh, travellers. I read about black people and, and also they had another category for black prisoners of war, the way they were, they were treated. Uh, asocials, people that didn't fit into the social structure that was there. People with disabilities, Freemasons, homosexuals. I read about political opponents, about trade unionists and Polish or Slovak prisoners of war. And I got to the end of the pamphlet and I thought that was interesting. But there's something that's not even been mentioned. There was no mention, and I don't know why, there's no mention of any Jewish people being harmed. And there were other books, and, and I'm sure that they were dedicated over there. But as I read that through, about the expectations of, 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 of Holocaust Memorial, I expected that it would mention the Jews. You see, it didn't do exactly what it said on the tin. It gave all the other groups but not the main group that suffered the most. And I think sometimes as Christians, we can be a little bit guilty of focusing on being at services, of tuning into this, of attending that, of speaking to this person on the phone, of being in touch with them on the internet, of bumping into people in the streets and, 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 and sharing. And we don't give time to Christ. We're known as Christians. So Christ should be predominantly in our lives, seen in our lives, in all that we do. And I want to encourage us not to be like that book when it didn't really do what it said, but that we, can, we will live up to the flagging that we have as being Christians, that Christ is the Lord of our lives. He is the one who is central. We need to ensure that we deliver exactly what it says on our tin. The, next, the um, other scripture that I mentioned is 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul's first letter to Timothy, and verse, reading from verse 3. And, and it says this, and it's a, it's a repeated phrase. Uh, same as it was um, the same yesterday, today and forever, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. This one says that we need to come to a knowledge of the truth. If we don't know Jesus, as we should know Jesus, then people won't see Jesus as they ought to see Jesus in our lives. 1 Timothy 2, 3 says this, This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus. In the middle of those three verses is that phrase, that God wants us to come to a knowledge of the truth. Everyone. God isn't selective. Whosoever will may come. Anyone can come to, 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 to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the mediator between us. He has to be so central in, 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 in where we are. Then in the second letter, chapter 2 and verse 2, that phrase is there again. It says this from verse 24, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. And that, and, and, that, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, 
who has taken them captive to do his will. Again, we see that the scripture is saying that even if we have strayed away, if people have strayed away, we need to just get beside them, invest time in them. Not just saying, God bless you, have a nice day. But being willing to have them round, arrange to have coffee, arrange to sit and speak with them and, and encourage them. Let them, let the love of God flow through us that they may come to a knowledge of the truth. And then the, repeat, uh, the, the phrase is again repeated in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6. It says this, they are the kind who worm their way in, into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. We live a life where we are constant, constantly learning new things. Some we don't even realise we're learning. Others we try to learn and we struggle. Technology with me. Um, uh, but, but all the time we are learning and learning. But the scripture here says it's not what we do. It's not those efforts that we make. It's the reality of just talking to Jesus. Speaking into situations and letting the Lord be there. Not always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. We need to come to that knowledge of the truth. When Jesus stood before Pilate, the end of their conversation, it didn't really end because Pilate asked a question. And he said to Jesus, what is truth? And then it says he turned and went away. What Pilate didn't realise was that he was looking at the answer when he asked the question. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. He must be predominant in our lives. He wants to be and he's just itching to bless us. And Pilate says, what is truth? Had he hesitated, had he waited, maybe Jesus would have said something, but it never happened, it didn't occur. He made this clever little remark, well, what is truth? And turned and went away. And Jesus was taken to be crucified. Ron Seale says it does what it says on the tin. Exactly what it says. It says on us, Christian, let's live it out. Let's be that person we can be only because Jesus can make us that person. And through him, we will be, we will be victorious in life. We will be fruitful and we will know his way. Have a great day. The Lord bless you. Amen.